Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Gents. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 105 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we talk with Jinx Farmer, owner of Jinx Farmer Plantsman and author of Crinum, Unearthing the History and Cultivation of the World's Largest Bulb. Jinx shares his cultivation tips and growing tips for crinum lilies and also a bit of the fascinating lore of this underrated plant. The plant profile is on the Carolina Allspice. And we share what's going on in our garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events we want to let you know about. This episode, we're joined by Augustus Jenkins Farmer III. He's a Renaissance plantsman, and we're going to talk to him all about growing crinum. Welcome, Jenks. Thank you, Kathy. Well, first, I think we should address your name. Let our listeners know that you go by Jenks, correct? Yes. Uh, you know, Augustus Jenkins Farmer the Third was a pretty big name for a little boy, and <laughs> it took me about 50 years to grow into it, I guess. Um, yeah, I love so, that name, Augustus. Yeah, so I go by Jenks. Uh, there were already two Gusses, and they just decided on Jenks. That's what I wondered, because I thought the nickname for Augustus is usually Gus, but that's also a kind of older sounding name for a little boy as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So the other the other part of my name that throws people is is Farmer. You know, people will, mm-hmm. a lot of times people look at my company name, which is Jinx Farmer Plantsman, and they think that Farmer and Plantsman are describing what we do, but Nope. I was, uh, I was born to it, I guess. I tried all, as hard as I could to run away from it when I was a teenager and to move to the city and get away from farming, but I ended up doing it again. Yep. It was in the stars, and we'll talk about that in a minute and your background, but I was also going to point out that your name, Jenks, J-E-N-K-S, is so similar to my last name, J-E-N-T-Z, Gents, that I think some people, when they're saying it, will almost say it the same way. Right. Which is fine to hear. And I think, you know, my name has German and Dutch origins that, you know, somewhere came from Jensen and got transmogrified at some point, which I'm sure the same with your family names. Yeah, I think mine's pretty much English and uh, described what my family did. Mm Mm-hmm. They're very literal. (laughs) So you were saying that you tried to run away from the plant life as a teenager, but let's dial it back to when you were born as Augustus into your family. Were you born with a green thumb and did you have chlorophyll in your veins from that very start? Uh, We, I I grew up, uh, unlike lots of kids in the seventies, I grew up more like the fifties. Um, we were on a little country farm down a dirt road, wood heat in the house. We grew all of our own vegetables and flower gardening was a big, a big part of life. Uh, not just for me as a, a hobby as a kid, but, you know, we went around, um, visiting all the old ladies in town and I, you know, I shouldn't have said old ladies. We went around visiting all the old gardeners around. <laughs> so it was definitely um, a big part of my life. I, I, gosh, I just thought of this when I said this, an old Russian man who lived uh, in the country and grew poppies. And I remember we would go see him every, every spring just to see his poppies. So it was definitely a big part of my life growing up. Sometimes I, I hated it because it was work. You know, we, we had to grow our own okra. Uh, mm-hmm. We had to be out there when my friends were, um, you know, at, playing in their swimming pools and things like that in town. And 
like a lot of a lot of teenagers in the 70s i was ready to see the big bold new world so i tell people i i never had a a shower or an air conditioner until i went to clemson but my first airplane ride was to enroll in the university of zambia halfway around the world wow so i was trying pretty hard <laughs> yeah i was trying pretty hard to get away but uh, everywhere I would go, I would end up like hanging out and walking along the riverbanks in Zambia, looking at bulbs. And I eventually ended up out in Seattle uh, doing a, a master's program at the University of Washington. Um, so as hard as I, th as, as much as I thought I wanted to get away from it, I never, I never really, um, made much of an attempt i just tried to do it in different places <laughs> and so once you got your master's what was your first uh employment my f my first job was well so my first job with a master's it was a master's in botanical garden management um out at the center for urban horticulture and I was called back to South Carolina. I had uh, no desire to come back. I was looking at San Diego and St. Louis and Seattle. And I got a call from a, a, a place I had done an internship and they had recently acquired 70 acres and $7 million and they needed someone to spearhead the building of um, the first botanical garden in South Carolina in, in decades. So it was an awesome opportunity, and I, I'm still really involved with Riverbanks Botanical Garden. In fact, I'm going out to look at the Crinum Collection this afternoon. Um, I thought that I would stay here a couple years and probably go back to Seattle, but uh, that was 25 years ago, and here I am. Hmm. And could you describe uh, where you are in South Carolina and what the growing conditions are like. Do you have clay soil, sandy soil? What's it generally like there in your hardiness zone? Okay, well, well I, I have two houses. Um, I have a, a city house, so a lot of the gardening that I do is on a small city lot, which has a, a sandy top layer and a clay base. We are zone 8B, but in the city, we may be even a little bit warmer. Um, we get a lot of rain. Well, actually, our rain is probably really similar to yours in D.C. Our, our heat is similar to yours, except that it probably extends longer than yours. So, for example, we don't have frost until about Thanksgiving. Um, mm -hmm. We're... Today, this is uh, coming on the end, into, into the end of May, we are going to be 90, and that's, that's pretty typical. We're in this, tra this transition point between spring and summer, and it happens really fast here. So next week, it will be summertime. Now, our, our, farm, though, our farm is a little bit different. It's about, uh, about an hour out of town. And that's where we grow our crinum lilies. And they're grown in the ground, just like any row crop. And it's a, the farm that I grew up on. Um, my mom still lives there and she still heats with wood. We are a little bit cooler there, but the big difference is that we get earlier frost because of the, the lack of urban heat sinks. Um, and that so that place looks basically like a field of flowers, all in rows. We have uh, 150 foot long rows of flowers that in the summertime are absolutely amazing. We interplant lots of veggies with them. So we still grow all of our own vegetables and we interplant lots of uh, annuals with them too. So, so that it's pretty for our, our tourists. But I, just realized the other day when I was gardening, I spent my whole life in botanical gardens and doing garden design and telling people to like break out of the straight lines, like make some curvy lines. <laughs> and I was looking around, I'm like, 
oh damn I, all i'm doing is gardening in straight lines now <laughs> Well, it certainly makes it a lot easier to tend crops and to get weeds out if you do straight lines for that sort of gardening. Yeah, yeah. So that's our that's our climate. It's not all that different from D.C. We just get a, a little less cold and a shorter period of cold, a little more heat and a longer period of heat. Yeah, we're jumping into summer quickly ourselves here with 90 degrees in the, in the forecast in a couple of days, and then it will be summer as you were describing. So most of our listeners for Garden DC are zone six and seven. So the biggest question I think we would have about crinum that we're going to discuss today is, are any hardy for those plant zones? So the short answer is most definitely. And I'll tell you what they are, but I'm going to back up a little bit and tell you when I started at Riverbanks Botanical Garden, we started building what was probably the first and largest collection of crinum in the country. Um, there, there were other people doing some awesome work, but we had the resources to really, to really build this up. But when I would come up to DC, which I, I did a lot because I have lots of peers and friends, people would say, don't bring me those things. They're not going to grow. And that was a common perception just 25 <laughs> years ago that crinums were deep south plants only. So we started sending them out all over. Anybody that would take a crinum, I would give them one. So now I have continued that in my business and we have uh, clients in the um, Pittsburgh Zoo and the gorilla exhibit has crinums. We have uh, pr private clients in Martha's Vineyard. Um, I just sent a bunch for testing to Chicago. I don't know how hardy, how, how, how Chicago is going to be, but yeah, there are a lot of great crinums and, and crinum growers that I see whenever I'm in DC, all, all around DC, even out into the, the suburbs. So they don't have to be in just the heat sink. Um, but out into Maryland and up into Baltimore. So the crinum that is absolutely the most cold hardy is called the orange river lily. The name can be a little deceptive. It is not at all orange. It's pale pink, white sometimes, and sometimes striped. It's named for the river that it comes from in South Africa. And I have seen that one in um, up, up near Boston. I've seen it, a big clumps of it in Copenhagen, Denmark. So it's absolutely rock hardy. It's a, it's a cool plant for us. It's almost finished mm -hmm. flowering. So it started about the 1st of April and then it'll finish up now and it'll take a summer break. So in cooler climates, like I know in St. Louis, it flowers more like the end of May and into June. So some of the dates that I threw out while we're talking today, y'all, you may have to, uh, scale back and forth a little bit. If you're in a colder zone, things are going to flower a little bit later. So looking at your website and your store on it, so you have a cold hardy collection, which includes that Orange River one you mentioned. And looking at the photos, it occurs to me, because we are, of course, uh, talking and not showing photos, that we should describe what a crinum lily is to our listeners. And I would say the closest thing in looks would be an amaryllis or maybe some of the other tall strappy lilies. But how do you describe it to people? I tell people to imagine that Christmas amaryllis on steroids. Mm -hmm. So it looks like that. It looks like any lily, except that um, the difference between this and a true lily is the leaf form, where true lilies have, have a stalk with flowers on them and lanceolate leaves coming off. This crinum has more, I mean, this, this, yeah, this plant has more like um, a fountain of corn-like foliage, I guess, that comes right out of the ground. And the flowers rise above that to generally to about three feet. The color range of crinums um, is, is not all that great in the ones that we can grow well. It's they're whites, very pure whites. There are lots of stripes, 
there's some sort of greenish cast to some of them, um, greenish or khaki. Sometimes they call it champagne color. And then they go into very rich burgundy pinks. So that's kind of, that's kind of the range. If you look at crinums around the world, there are yellows and there, um, there are some, some other yellowish whites, but generally they're limited to much drier climates. Does that, does that describe them, you think? Yeah, I think that describes it perfectly. So that kind of a cluster of big trumpet-like blooms at the top of a stalk with strappy foliage in kind of a mound around the base. And I imagine that the strappy foliage stays year round for you in South Carolina, but maybe dies back for us here in zone six or seven. Yeah. And you know, Kathy, sometimes um, even the warmer you get, the less things die back. And it just, a lot of times they just look ratty, like in the winter time. So, so not just crying them, but salvias and bananas and some things like that that maybe don't die completely back for us i just take a machete and chop them off right at the ground just so when they come out next year they have a nice fresh flush and with the flower stalk once the flowers are spent do you just chop that off and compost that or does it come back at all no, it won't, it'll never flower again, and whether or not you chop it off depends on a couple of things. Um, the orange river lily and a few species will set seed, and the, the seeds are really fun to grow and easy to grow. So we leave them if we're going to collect seeds. The other thing we did um, with them was we had we have so much flower stalk waste that it would drive me crazy to to throw all this stuff away. So for the sake of tidiness in a garden, mo- most of the time you would cut the flower stalk off when it's done. Mm-hmm. So we started, uh, we started selling them as cut flowers because the flower stalk has this really awesome, very modern, I guess, sort of sculptural thing that stays green and uh, it stays thick and erect and doesn't even need water. So we just sell them as cut flowers. We had to come up with a cool name for them. So we call them chicken feet flowers because it kind of looks like a chicken foot on top of a stick. <laughs> Which, I know that doesn't sound very appealing, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. The Another maintenance thing with crinums, they they can get a little messy because they're tropicals and big growers. So by the end of August, we will often cut the entire plant down to the ground. I mean, like right down to the ground, just leave a couple of inches, throw all that top foliage away, and then it'll come right back. But by the time it, you know, by the time the weather's coming out and like fall asters are flowering and you want to really be outside again, the crinums look nice and fresh again. So that's just a little trick for caring for them. Nice. Thanks for sharing that. And so they look like they would be heavy feeders to me. Do you do a lot of fertilizing? Well, we don't. And I, I did intentionally took our farm completely organic a few, uh, 10, 10 or 12 years ago. We had been no-till forever. My dad was one of these guys that used to get the old Rodale's Organic Gardening when it was a little newspaper magazine. So he did no-till on the farm, and I've kept it that way. And we do what we call sheet composting, and that's something that a word that we just came up with. So we do cover crops in the winter and in the summer, and then we chop in place and drop all that green onto the crinum fields around the plants. And then we do a mulch of Bermuda hay over. So we're adding a lot of, we're adding organic compound, uh, organic fertilizer on a regular basis, but we're not adding lots of synthetics like you, you would think about when you say something needs a lot of fertilizer. Crinums, because they have this giant bulb and we didn't really talk about that yet. We, we've talked about how they look above ground, but how they look below ground is, is really fascinating too. They can be a bulb the size of a softball and they'll grow into clumps that are 
400-pound uh, clumps. So they have this massive storage unit, this carbohydrate storage unit below ground. So if you want to really build them, they need a lot of fertilizer. But once you get a, a nice clump established, most of the time you don't have to do anything to it. Before we jump into the bulb talk, I wanted to ask about the cover crops you mentioned. Are you using field peas or what do you use for a cover crop? So if you came to our farm in the end of September, you would think we were a pea farm. <laughs> it's covered with field peas. Uh, we started using sun hemp, which is a really high nitrogen producer. But we also consider our flowers and other vegetables to be our cover crops. So for example, right now, one of our fields is absolutely covered with bachelor buttons, or some people know that as corn flour. Mm -hmm. And we do that for a couple of reasons. Uh, we, have, we have tours and sort of happy hour tours and lunchtime tours for groups. So we need, you know, we need it to be pretty, but also those roots are doing work in the soil, even though they're not the kind of cover crops that people think of as far as nitrogen producing, the roots are working the soil. And then when we come through in a couple of weeks and chop all of those bachelor buttons and drop them in place, that will become part of our compost and fertilizer for next year. And I just got a... Uh, Today, this morning, I just got my nematode report. Are y'all do y'all have ne a lot of nematode problems? Not huge, but a little bit. Okay, well, you know they're tiny. They're they're tiny um, worms, basically. Mm -hmm. You can't see them, but they can be a real problem for agricultural crops and sometimes for gardeners. And we are required by our Department of Plant Protection to monitor our nematode count. So about 10 years ago, we started overseeding a winter cover crop of turnips and radish because those plants give off a gas that reduces nematodes. So I'm really happy to say that my nematode report count of the pest has gone down and down and down since we started doing that. So our cover crops do lots of things besides just add the the nitrogen that that peas do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are great choices. And dialing back to the bulb that you brought up, so the subtitle of your book is Unearthing the History and Cultivation of the World's Biggest Bulb. And I know that you've gotten some blowback and some <laughs> flack on that title. So let's talk about that controversy. Wait, wait, do you know that or are you or have you heard it and had, or you got something to tell me? No, <laughs> I had heard that. <laughs> um Honestly, I hadn't gotten a lot, but it was that was an intentionally provocative title. You know, we you, we have to have something to to get people's attention, right? And we are I'm writing a the first book ever on crinums. It's a obscure plant and an odd bulb that has a reputation for being limited to a small range of the US, undeserved reputation. So I needed something to uh, to be a hook, and I talked to a lot of botanists asking about the biggest bulbs in the world. And it's interesting if you if you do some searches just on search engines, nobody answers that question. So there are some other um, really big bulbs. I I talked to a guy. I'm in constant contact with some people in South Africa, and that's where the biggest bulbs are likely to be. But then, of course, you'll see uh, you can you can also see this guy who pops up holding like the biggest onion in the world, you know. And so that's a little bit different because he's really, really worked to cultivate this thing and make it a 20 pound onion. Um, but crinums are definitely one of the top three contenders. As I said, the bulbs can be volleyball. Actually, that's not right. They can be the size of my head. And once they clump together, you end up with these massive knotted clumps that are 400, easily 400 pounds. Some of the, um, the, one of the problems I had with that title, though, is that 
there are tiny crinums too, and I hated to exclude them because I love my tiny crinums. We have crinums that are three inches tall. They're crinums that are totally aquatic, and their bulbs are like the size of golf balls. But um, yeah, that the title was has been kind of fun to bat around with people. <laughs> I love tiny crinum. I think that would be a perfect <laughs> name for like a rock band or something. <laughs> The tiny crinums. And I'm interested about those aquatic ones. So are they for the edge of a pond or can you actually put them in the middle of your water garden? They're, one of the most popular aquarium plants is a tropical crinum. It has these beautiful wavy leaves and you see it in lots of aquariums. Like if you see an aquarium in a restaurant or mm-hmm. you know a bar um, or a real serious hobbyist. So some of them are totally underground. I I mean underwater. I've I've been in Africa chest deep in water in a black water stream and there were flowers popping up out the water and I dug down I, I had gone specifically to see these and they were these are crinums that are rooted in the bottom of the stream bed. They're in fact most crinums no matter where they're from around the world are associated with water now they're not necessarily in water all the time like our crinum americanum grows along the river banks but it's kind of high it's kind of perched up high so when we have our dry season august and september it'll be totally dried out so it can tolerate that drying as most crinums can but then they can also tolerate flooding, which which makes them really great urban plants, especially like we're, we've been using them in Charleston and Savannah in the parks in places that flood because they can tolerate days underwater and they can also tolerate salt. Are they appropriate for a container garden? So you're talking about multiplying bulbs that can get pretty big. Um, are there certain ones that you would recommend for container growing? So even even some of the big ones are used in containers. In Southeast Asia, you see Crinum asiaticum and the ones called Queen Emma lilies. They're very common in containers there, but that's much more tropical than we are. The Crinums that we can grow that are appropriate for containers, I think the smaller ones, like one of my favorites, um, is called Spring Joy, and it's in flower right now a really delicate pink and a relatively small foliage. It looks, it looks like a really big day lily, I guess. There's a tiny one um, that's eight inches called Minihune. And Minihune is, is a burgundy leaf. Like, you know how like sparkling burgundy pineapple lily, that color. Mm -hmm. Um, I've seen big, I've seen big pots of that at the um, Smithsonian Gardens. I, I doubt that it's cold hardy for you all. You would probably need to grow it in a container and then put it in a basement like you would um, other tropicals that you have to protect in a garage or a basement. Another, um, another small one that has, that has really beautiful foliage is called Jubilee. And that one is maybe knee high, but it has big flowers that are like just sultry just that that crazy tropical sweet they're big pink flowers and that fragrance attracts big sphinx moths in the summertime but because it has a handsome foliage it makes a nice container plant too yeah, we haven't even talked, Jinx, at all about the fragrance or scent of these. <laughs> so we're talking about lilies, and that's usually one of the main reasons people will be growing them is because of that heady fragrance. Are there varieties that are more fragrant than others, and are there times of day, like morning or evening, where the scent is heavier? Yeah, definitely. And Kathy, I just had this awesome experience with the uh professor from Cornell who came down and spent three days on the farm because he's studying nocturnal pollinators. So crinums are nocturnally fragrant. So they they look the same pretty much during the daytime, but then in the evening, they really start pumping out their fragrance. It it was so cool to be with this guy. I, I Actually, I have a blog on it, an essay on the stuff that I learned from him. That fragrance 
while you and I can detect it at a certain level, moths, the big moths, um, luna moths, spink moths, hawk moths, they can detect it from miles away, even when it's just a couple of molecules of that fragrance in the air. Wow. And that fragrance draws them from miles away. And they come to the flowers and I didn't really understand this either, but moths are really dirty. Like they're not, they're not like insects that preen or clean themselves. They just dive right into that flower, trying to get that nectar and they get covered in pollen. So they're very effective pollinators. But mm. one crinum, like the Orange River one that I was telling you about earlier, it has this very distinctive, um, sharp, sort of gin and tonic sort of cutting fragrance that's hmm. most people don't find it attractive pleasant but that's the only one all the other ones have really sweet perfumes and you can take a a little bouquet of crinums into the house and in the daytime they're not fragrant and they may not look all that great in the daytime but about seven o'clock at night they just start releasing their their perfume yeah it sounds like the the Orange River ones might have that scent that's similar to the Narcissus that's kind of like that sharp antiseptic smell that, you know, is either a love or hate thing. Right, right. And, you know, what um, what Dr. Rugoso explained to me is that that fragrance is an indicator. It has a, a lot, it means that there's a lot of nitrogen in the nectar of that plant. And nitrogen is critical for, well, for all animals, but especially for egg production so it may be that that fragrance is actually telling a moth like you know come over here don't go to that little madonna lily over there <laughs> right I, you, you're going to get a little something besides some sweet nectar if you come to this flower i thought that was so cool yeah interesting and so it's the lily family of course so that usually means it's poisonous in all parts so not good for your pets or small children but does that make it deer resistant? So let me address the, um, the toxicity. You know, most most plants that are have alkaloids in them are toxic, but that also means that they're important for us for medicine. So crinums do have a really long history throughout Asia and Africa, and unfortunately, it's you know not documented in the U.S. about the Native American use. So they've been used for all kind of medicinal reason, um, reasons too. And I, I drink crinum tea, which I buy from a, a company in Vietnam to make sure that it's the right stuff. Crinum's alkaloids have recently been shown to have a significant slowing of glioblastomas and certain kinds of cancers. To get uh, to reach a toxicity level, you would have to eat a lot of them, and they're not very pleasant. So they're not something that you really need to worry about. Uh, your pets, you should certainly be aware of it. But you know, I we have donkeys that weed our fields, and the donkeys never touch a crinum. Mm -hmm. Deer, on the other hand, are gonna eat anything if the pressure is high enough as you know that so crinum would be last on their list and what we find around us where we don't have big urbanization yet so we don't have a lot of deer problem yet is that they go on to other things or if they do touch a crinum then they don't come back to it later but on some of the coastal islands i do some design work down around charleston their uh, deer pressure is huge, and they'll they'll eat the crinums. Wow, I'm surprised about that. Yeah, are there other pests that would attack crinum? And our we're really lucky in our climate. We don't have a lot of a lot of um, pests. We have mm -hmm. a, a giant grasshopper. We have these big louver grasshoppers that are very localized, so they will eat them. They're more of a problem in Florida. Otherwise, no, they get a little bit of rust, leaf rust. And some people really dislike that. It, it doesn't bother me that much. But, you know, one, one reason that it's, it's almost easy for us to be an organic farm is that we don't really have to do pest control. Nice. So the rust sounds maybe similar to what daylilies might get. 
Right. And the control is the same. I mean, basically, you can just cut the leaves back and throw them away. Easy enough. So are there certain varieties of the crinum lily that you just love? Like, I couldn't live without these. I have a whole brand new book that's full of them. So you can <laughs> look at the index. There are uh, six pages of crinums. I don't know how I would live, <laughs> live without. Um <laughs> I'll tell you, one of the things that I decided early on in my career was that I was only going to grow crinums and that like in the botanical garden, we were only going to collect crinums that were great garden plants because there are crinums that are dogs. There, There's a crinum that's real common throughout the South. It's common in cemeteries because it has a white lily-like flower, hmm. but it flops over. Like, uh, I don't want to go out and flop. I don't want to go out and stake things up. So, so honestly, the crinums that I write about are great garden plants. But I think my personal favorites are the later flowering ones that are deep reds. And I, I just like anything that comes on in the heat of summer after so many things have um, other, other perennials have kind of tired out. So Ellen Boussingay is one. One that I know is cold hardy for you is called Super Ellen. And Super Ellen is a burgundy red, but it gets about six feet tall. Lorraine Clark is one of the deepest reds. And there's a one that's not quite red, but it's a really rich pink called Claude Davis. And that one I I have growing out um, out at a friend's house out by the the zoo in D.C. So I know that one's cold hardy too. Mm -hmm. I'll have to like wrangle an invitation to see that one. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so uh, you were talking earlier about letting the seeds set on some of your crinums to collect that. And are they easy to grow from seed? How many years does it take from seed to bloom? Well, they're easy to grow and they're fascinating because they they're, they actually photosynthesize. So unlike most seeds, which dry out and become little packets that you could carry around for years, Crinum seeds are green and they look like green walnuts and they are photosynthesizing the entire time they're germinating. So one trick to growing them is to not cover that seed up. You want it to get the sunlight. It takes from the time you, from the time you collect and put a seed in, it takes about six to eight weeks before you see anything happening. And then for I'd say four years to your first flower. So it's one of the problems with crinum breeding is that it takes a really, really long time to get n- numerous generations. So for example, one of mine that I selected, uh, um, it's called crinum aurora glorialis because it's it opens green, it goes to pale pink, and the third day it's really rich pink. But I've been working with it for, I think, coming on 16 years, and we have just about four years ago got enough of it to to start selling. And it's because of that, the way that you hybridize, when you're doing hybridization, you know, you want the successive generations in order to get the new and weird um, genetic variations. So in order to do that with something that takes four years, you're you're talking about eight years until you really start selecting at all. But nonetheless, the whole process is fun and they're, they're fun to watch grow. They're vigorous. Um, with crinums, you get lots of variation. So if you grow them from seed, you're going to get one that's really big and, you know, one that's really dwarf. You get one, um, you can tell by the coloration in the bulb, what color they're going to flower. So you'll get some that are have pink pink to the bulbs and some that are green which means they're going to be white that's interesting that the bulbs indicate the the color of the bloom and are you hybridizing or breeding them for any specific traits so you were talking about you know a stronger stalk that doesn't flop over um, maybe a shorter one or are you looking for particular colors in the flowers or that sort of thing Well, I got to tell you, I'm a terrible breeder. You know, that's a mindset that like, it's it's a very organized mindset. And I I don't have that, um, or I don't have that organization. I kind of jump from here to there. 
there's a guy that works with us who breeds. He, he's worked on the farm for a long time. He's uh, very interested in taking, making things compact because, you know, the, the reputation mm-hmm. is condoms are all big and messy. And of course, people have smaller houses now and we want containers. But there's a guy named Jay York up in Raleigh who's done a lot of that kind of breeding. And one of my favorites is his Kim Maureen, which he named for his wife. And it is a nice, compact plant. I wouldn't say it's tiny, but it stays in a tidy clump. So for me, definitely the form is a lot more important than, say, the color. I'm hearing a lot of the names you're saying that plant they're named after a certain person. Is there a crinum society or breeding group that approves and registers them? Uh, no, there there was at one time, and it's kind of, you know, with a lot of things from my like my mentor's generation, um, they're they're way beyond being able to manage that that sort of thing. So not really. My my very first one was eventually accepted into the Royal Horticulture Society, which is kind of the gold standard. Anyway, there is also the um, a Pacific Bulb Society, and they have a, a lot of crinums on their website, but they're not, they're also not a group that, you know, keeps the official collection and official naming. So uh, as far as I know, that's not happening now. We, we do have a group on Facebook called Crinum Lovers, which is just a group of people who like to share pictures of their crinums. And that, that's a great way to learn um, and to see the variation. And then we also have a, um, a Google map on our website that shows where our clients are growing. And let's share that website address with our listeners. Oh, okay. It's my name, jinxfarmer.com. And that's J- J-E-N-K-S farmer, no spaces or dashes, dot com. That's right. Yeah. So Kathy, there is a, Crinum have an interesting history that it revolves around the maritime trade and probably the slave trade. Um, they have been in the U.S. a lot longer than their official introduction date, I believe. And they have a very important medicinal as well as spiritual uses all through throughout most of Africa. They're, they have some similar uses in South America where the, the maritime and slave trade first went to Brazil and up through the Caribbean and into the Southeast. And that's a sort of hidden history, I guess. It's very hard to put together. There's a, an official history, which would be the, you know, the, the old English white guys who wrote everything down that they were doing. Mm -hmm. Um, And they, they have a really fascinating history too. There was one that was selected and named for the gardener at High Clare Castle, which is uh, the the set for for Downton Abbey, but Crinums by the by 1900 or so, even though they had fascinated the the rich European gardeners and the Caribbean um, European gardeners, they totally fell out of favor, and really they they didn't hadn't found their heyday again until recently, but there was always a group of men who mostly men who kept them going. And there was a Amaryllis Society that they worked through. There was an International Bulb Society that they worked through. And those those guys, and there was one woman that I, that was my mentor. Um, her name was Marcel Shepard. They are almost all gone now, but they're the people who kept the information alive. And they're honestly, they kept a lot of the varieties alive. I think these things would have been, you know, lost to ditches or development if not for that older group of of horticulturalists. It's great to hear about some of that history. And yeah, some of that that may have been passed down, but wasn't written down, um, I guess will be lost for the ages. But we can still kind of find maybe some of those traces of those plants where you were talking about where, where the trade was happening and kind of trace that back. Right. And, and I find I'm constantly digging through libraries and, uh, and, and talking to people. I find little bits that we can tie together to make that 
argument all the time. And I love for people to send me little, little, um, stories. I recently, I got a, an awesome article from new Orleans. There's a, a national park site called the battle of new Orleans. That's always been focused on the, the war. And recently they've been clearing what was a, a freed community of African Americans. Once they started clearing all of these lilies started popping up and they sent me a picture and said, Hey, are these crinum? Yeah, those are definitely crinum. And then their next question was, are these remnants from this African American community that's long gone? Like, well, I can't, I can't tell you that, but it, it makes perfect sense that they would be. If no one else has been gardening there for the past, you know, 120 years, it's totally possible that crinums, because they have a long lifespan, have been there and also seeded in from that community. And that does bring up that crinum are known uh, to be a pass along plant. So something that you would see, you know, in a grandmother's garden or something, but not so available in the trade. Um, so people can order bulbs from you, but are they available generally from other bulb companies or growers or nurseries? So they're not often available as container plants because they're big bulbs with big root systems and they're just very hard to grow in containers. You know, we grow a few things like in one gallons, but we grow in the field and we dig, we have a bleaching process in order to stay in compliance with our plant protection and um, department. And we mail a bare root plant that's about 18 inches long and has a, a baseball size bulb. There are there are other nurseries like that. One of uh, one of my friends has an awesome nursery in North Carolina called Terracea Farms, and they do all kinds all kinds of bulbs, and they import bulbs from all over. So we we have worked with them a lot. Lots of specialty nurseries will sell, and you and there are lots of small collector nurseries that you can find on you know on eBay and places like that. Other bulb nurseries. So if, if you go to a big bulb supplier that you generally get tulips and daffodils from, they're often, they're importing their bulbs from India. Uh, India is the most common import place right now. And those are good quality. They're healthy bulbs. But the difference from my perspective is that they go, those go through a heat process and they're dried. So they're, they don't have any living roots and it just, it takes them um, two months longer to get established in the garden. But pass-alongs are, that's an awesome option. And a lot mm -hmm. of times pass-alongs come with those stories that are so important because they connect us to, to generations. You know, I mentioned the age of crinums. I, I have the very first crinum that I got back on that farm in Beach Island, South Carolina, back in the 70s. I was... I don't know, 10 years old or so. And it was on the farm and it just came up in the middle of the grass. And because I'm a geek and I do stuff like this, I'm constantly looking for old pictures of the house and farm. And I recently found a picture from 1953 with that crinum right there growing in the same place. It grows today. It has flowers on it right now. So what is that? 70 years old? Wonderful. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> I love plants that can live without our interference. Yeah, without our interference and without our energy input and without our mm -hmm. pesticide input and also with uh stories. Like I know who planted that and I love hmm. I love the stories that get passed along with crinums. Absolutely. So those are so fascinating and thanks for sharing your stories with our listeners today, Jenks. And any last final thoughts on crinum growing and also how can people contact you to follow up for more information? Last thoughts on crinum growing. You know, I, I firmly believe that you should grow things that love your climate. To try to uh, grow some of these big Asian ones and some of the big tropical ones is just more work than I can do. I don't, I don't have a greenhouse. So I really believe in growing things that have been tested by your local botanical gardens and horticulture societies and asking around for that. I have no doubt that around Maryland, Northern Virginia, and D.C., you will see 
crinums occasionally at plant swaps. You'll definitely see them in gardens. Uh, that's the best way to make your selections. And we try to conglomerate some of that information on our website and also in our emails and, and certainly in this new book. If people want to order the book, they can do that at, at my website or it's on Amazon and Kindle. And we have, uh, uh, if you happen to be in the South, um, it's in botanical garden gift shops down here. I'm on Instagram and Facebook and I'm on TikTok, but I don't look at it. Our young high school intern does it, so I don't really know what I do on TikTok. But you can contact me through any of those places. And Kathy, if people want to, um, if any, you know, if anybody wants to bring a group down, we've had bus tours from uh, Kentucky and Tennessee and Florida. Um, Aiken, Aiken and Augusta, Georgia are right near us, and they're awesome gardens. So. If anybody's thinking about a bus tour down to the south, um, we'd love to host you and show you our farm and help you find some of those those cool gardens around. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jinx. Hey, thanks for having me. I'll, I'll um, look forward to the email and to listening to this and to listening to your podcast. Carolina Allspice Plant Profile Carolina Allspice, Calicanthus floridus, is also known as sweet shrub. It is native to the eastern United States and is known for its fragrant blossoms in mid to late spring. The roots and bark also have a scent when injured or rubbed that is similar to camphor. The flowers are a dark burgundy color and the leaves are deep green that turn light yellow in the fall before dropping off. It can grow from full sun to full shade and tolerates most any soil type. Though it prefers moist ground and to be positioned in dappled shade as a woodland understory plant. This shrub can get eight feet wide and high, so plant it where it can attain its full size and it will not need pruning. It occasionally sends out root suckers, and you can cut those off, or dig and pot them up to gift them to another gardener. Carolina allspice is deer resistant and has no major pests or diseases. There is also a West Coast species, Calicanthus occidentalis, and a Chinese sweet shrub, Calicanthus chinensis. Popular Calicanthus cultivars and hybrids include Athens, which has chartreuse flowers, Venus, which is a compact grower that has white blooms with a banana scent, and Aphrodite, which has bright red flowers with a citrusy fragrance. Carolina allspice, you can grow that. What's new this week? Well, a heat wave is hitting the DC area, but the gardens are still looking incredible, especially the peonies, iris, roses, clematis, and much more. I'm really enjoying the scent and sight of my Japanese snowbell tree, also known as Styrex japonica. It is just nonstop and the pollinators can't get enough of it. Our May 2022 issue of Washington Gardener magazine is out, and you can find it online at washingtongardener.blogspot.com. Inside, there are stories about attracting song sparrows, growing and using Malabar spinach, Peperomia houseplant, dealing with grubs, early flowering bulbs for the bees, a rare look inside the Mormon temple, and an interview with the Netherlands Embassy Gardener that's really fun. Uh, also, the greening of the UDC campus for locals who haven't visited that campus lately in Van Ness neighborhood of DC. I urge you to stop by. You'll be amazed at the changes happening there. Some upcoming local garden events I want to let you know about are all taking place the first week of June. The first is on Thursday, June 2nd at 6.30 p.m. to 8 
and this is an online talk that I am giving for Brookside Gardens on ground covers. There is a fee of $12 and you can sign up online at Active Montgomery. If you cannot attend the live section, it will be recorded and available for registrants afterwards. On June 4th, Homestead Gardens in Davidsonville is hosting a chat and book signing with Hilton Carter. And that's from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. You can find out more about that at homesteadgardens.com and click on the events tab. That will be a fun one for houseplant lovers. And that same day, Saturday, June 4th, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. at the Farmyard in Parkton, Maryland, is the third annual plant sale fundraiser. They're looking for donations of plants and hard goods like tools and containers to sell. And that all is for the benefit of the American Landscape Institute. This fundraiser benefits their scholarship fund. And you can find out more about that at the farmyardllc.farm. And another event happening virtually and in person that same weekend, June 3rd through 5th, is being hosted by Mount Vernon in Northern Virginia. You can find out more about this at mountvernon.org. It's the Gardens and Landscapes in the Age of Washington and Now. If you sign up virtually, it's $25 and you can learn how George Washington and his contemporaries shape the natural world to achieve beauty through gardening and how their methods remain relevant today. Happy gardening! In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jentz and Terry Spite, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space, while also making Making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. The Urban Garden, 101 Ways to Grow Food and Beauty in the City comes out this spring. You can pre-order it now at Amazon.com and Bookshop.org. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.